Hey, hi, hello! We are here. It's another brew day here at Snail House. We put the towel on the floor first this time. Ha! Clean. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. I'm Sunfire, and I usually stream video games, but a couple times a month I like to stream home brewing beer from my tiny apartment kitchen. Welcome! Today we're going to be doing a honey lager. Here's the recipe right here. And today we're going to actually be going through the recipe kind of grain by grain to figure out why. Why did I do this? Why, why did I make a honey lager? Why did I pick those things that I picked? Uh, the other important thing that we're going to do today is figure out why there's a weird line. Nobody wants that, OBS. Nobody wants a weird line. Mmm, this is where my mouse was. We're going to figure out the grand mystery of what color this beer is actually going to be. I wrote the recipe as a brown lager, plugged it into the fancy calculator, and the calculator told me that it was going to be an amber lager. Subtle, but different. So we're going to actually find out, right here, right now at Snail House Brewing. What color is the honey lager going to be? There goes one layer of the mesh. Throw this off camera. How's everyone's day going today? Hmm. Be careful with bungee cords, man. They're sharp. And there goes the blanket. Alright, so there are three pieces of data that we want to gather at this point. We want to figure out what color is it? What temperature is it at? And how much sugar do we extract from these grains? Give it a nice stir. Oh man, it's hard to tell. I think, uh, I think it's gonna be amber. Which is not a problem. I'm happy to make an amber lager. And if the calculator is right, then that's not too, too surprising, you know? Oh, we gotta get our sparse water heated up. And we're gonna be doing uh, something new to me today. We are going to be making a yeast starter. Uh, so hopefully I don't screw that up. Because if I do, it'll be live on the internet. Alright, first we're going to skip this ad. Second, we're going to take the temperature. We are aiming for a lower temperature this time. We started at 152 and we ended at 148. Totally good. Well within our parameters here. Alright. Now we've got our refractometer here. The original gravity of this beer is going to be 46. So as long as we're in the high 30s at this point, I'll be happy. Even mid 30s, I'll take mid 30s. We're gonna let that uh, come down in temperature a little bit. Alright, aim at a light source. 
Again, not a bad thing. It's just going to have more alcohol in it than I intended, but not a lot of alcohol. All right, let's write that down. 41. So I've got four quarts of sparge water here. Some people are really adamant that your sparge water should be a certain temperature. And that temperature is usually 168, 170 Fahrenheit. I don't care. Um, this is just like to get more sugar out of the grains and it's gonna be a couple of points. Um, so just warm water, warm water is good enough. Some people will cold sparge. Uh, we're over 100 Fahrenheit, about 111. So we can move the grains over. All right, now we're gonna really see what this color is. It looks pretty brown to me. the grains sit in the sparge water for a few minutes. It's not an exact science. It's home brewing. It's whatever you want. Stir our grains back into the water. It looks pretty brown. I'm pretty pleased with that. Even if it comes out a dark amber, as long as it wasn't like an orange coppery amber, I think I can call it a brown lager. Okay, so we're doing a couple of things new today. We're building the yeast starter. It's a recipe I've never made before, if that's new. But we're also going to be utilizing what's called first wort hops. Down at the bottom, you'll see we just have one hop addition. And usually, if you've watched these streams before or if you're familiar with homebrewing recipes, usually that is a number associated with a time in the boil to add the hops. But today, we're going to use first wort hopping, which means we're actually going to add the hops now as it's warming up. And today we're going to be, oh, I don't want to use that scale. I'm going to use my better scale. Today we're going to be using Triumph Hops. Triumph Hops are an American hop. They're grown exclusively by Yakima Valley Hops. What, what? You can't see that. Yakima Valley Hops. They're awesome. Um, it's a medium alpha acid, it's about 9%, so that translates to how bitter it's going to make the beer. But Triumph has a German hop pedigree while being grown in the United States. So the hops that were crossed to create this new hop were mostly, I think three out of the four, uh, were German noble hops. So it's going to be very reminiscent of a German lager hop, but then have a little American twist to it. So we're going to pour out half an ounce of that. Pretty good. Uh, and I'll go through the flavor profile of Triumph again in a minute. Uh, I got to do... We gotta work quickly today. We gotta do some stuff at certain times. It's that hurry up and wait aspect of brewing. First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna pull out the wort, the 
that I need to make the yeast starter. So I need about one liter, and this is a one quart Pyrex. One liter and one quart are very similar in uh, volume. Liter is slightly bigger. Stir this up so we've got homogeneous gravity here. Oh yeah, she's definitely brown. I'm excited, okay. Like I said, I wasn't gonna be like heartbroken if it was amber, but I'm excited that it's brown. And there we go, just a little bit shy of a liter, but that's all I'm gonna take. We're gonna put this off to the side for now. My kitchen is too small, but we make it work. I don't even need this scale anymore, let's put it away. Okay, we pulled out the wort for the starter. We need our kettle spider for the hops. Boom, there it goes. Now we need to add hops. Boom. Those are all the hops we're going to use today. Very different from the hoppy golden ale that we made yesterday. All right, let's turn this on. Full boil. Just thinking. All right, we're gonna let this sparge go for a little bit longer. We're gonna let it drain. We're gonna add it back into this. And then as this is coming up to a boil, we're gonna work on our yeast starter. We're gonna work on the beer that we made yesterday. That isn't it, but it's gonna go in there. And there's maybe something else I was supposed to do. Fuck it, we'll figure it out. Kitchen is so small. That's okay. I love this apartment. Don't need the scissors anymore. Alright, so I have two kegs, and we're going to be using both kegs to ferment the beer. So I'm going to label them, because kegs look exactly the same from the outside. So in this keg here, it used to have Kolsch in it. So I ferment beer in the kegs, which means that I put in the wort, I put in the yeast, it fermented, and then I drank it. And now, all the way at the bottom, is all the yeast left over from the fermentation. So, I'm going to use this yeast that's still perfectly good. Hey class! Welcome, welcome! How you doing today? So, I'm going to use the yeast from my last beer to ferment the beer that I made yesterday. And the beer that I made yesterday was, hey, my mom is here. Hey, mama. Nat class woke up late, but got a lot done yesterday, so it's looking like a good Friday. Excellent. Has your art challenge started already? Starts with 45 minutes. Mama, this is my friend Nat Class. We met on the internet. She also lives in Oregon and is good friends with Butler Brian. She makes very pretty art. She's been showing me the ropes of this whole Twitch thing. I've got that keg labeled, so I'm not going to forget. I think we're ready to move our sparge over. 
You're going to get a head start because you have an art accountability meeting at 1. Interesting. All right. I know how to do this. I did this yesterday. So now, class, I, uh, I'm trying to focus. I know, Mama. I miss Butler, too. If he pops in later, he usually shows up for some of my streams because he's a very nice and supportive friend. But if he hops in later, I'll make sure to tell him you say hi. Um, in that class today, we're going to focus on grains and what flavors grains bring to a beer. I think. I think that's what we're going to do. I have visual aids. Um, and then we're also going to talk probably a little bit more about yeast because for the first time ever, I'm going to make a yeast starter and I've decided to do it live on the internet. Should be relatively simple. I am familiar with the basic steps and, and ideas behind it. Uh, but we'll see. And then we're also going to transfer our beer that I made yesterday into this keg here onto the yeast. So yeah, busy brew day. I'm excited. I got tea swizzy here to bring me strength. Stir our hops a little bit. I gotta be careful though with the drapey clothes over a flame. How's the sound, Nat Class? Can you hear me over the music? I want the music loud enough that when I'm not talking, you guys can hear it pretty well. But I don't want it overpowering me. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I did do a sound check this morning, but you never know what happens when you go live. Okay, so we've got what's called our first runnings. This was the wort that came off the mash for the first set. And now we've got our second runnings, so we're going to add that. All right, so I need a volume reading. This is a wooden spoon that I wrote on in Sharpie and marked different volumes on. Fun tip. Uh, let's see, hopefully we're at 14. Yeah, we are, a little over 14. Might even venture 14 and a half. Oh, but the kettle spider's in there, so that's gonna actually uh, change our volume a little bit. Cool, Let's write that down. And then I want a gravity reading. So we're going to bring out our refractometer. I'm going to do what I assume is Nat Class's favorite thing when I try to put the refractometer up to the camera. Oh yeah, she's definitely brown. That makes me happy. I did a, I did a terrible job yesterday. You couldn't see anything. Okay, so we got to put a couple of drops on the sample plate. We're gonna let it chill to room temperature, which doesn't take very long when it's just a couple of drops. So remember, the density of water in specific gravity is one. So anything that's in the water, in the liquid, is going to increase its density up from one. So let's see what we got. Um, it looks like we're around one or we're around 1044. So it's 1.044, but in jargon, the way that you say it is 1044. 
So we are 44 thousandths above, or I guess that would be 44 hundredths above one because specific gravity is a very, very small scale. All right, let's see if I can do it with my shaky little hands. I keep tripping over this towel. Let's get rid of it for now. When I do the actual pouring, I'll bring it back in. Okay. So, you're gonna see, hopefully, a blue line ugh, across a scale of numbers. I can do it, focus on one thing at a time. There we go. So that where that blue line hits, ugh, you can kinda see it. <laughs> it might have actually gone down a little bit. No, it's still 1044. Now I'm covered in work. Ten something, nice. Perfect. Okay. We added our hops. We're getting up to a boil. Next thing I'm going to do is boil the yeast starter. So, brewers make wort. Yeast make beer. There are several different ways to introduce yeast to the wort so that they can go on to happily ferment and make beer. The simplest way, when you're done, chill this down to the proper temperature, pour your yeast in. Yeast comes in two different forms. It'll either be liquid, like it'll be a really thick slurry that comes in either a pouch or a tube and you shake it so that it all homogenizes, and then you dump that straight in. Or, the type that I like to buy best is dried yeast. So this is a packet of dried yeast a friend of mine, it's not focusing, but a friend of mine sent me from England. So this is filled with dehydrated yeast, and when you add it back into liquid, it rehydrates and then is able to take off and get going from there. Usually when I use dry yeast, I cool the wort down to whatever temperature I'm going to ferment at, in this case 64, and then dump this in as is. Pretty simple, right? There are some complicated things with yeast though. They have to be at the right temperature, they have to have the right amount of sugar, they have to be at the right pH. We've kind of touched on that stuff before. They also have to have the right amount of yeast cells in order to take off and go properly. If you don't put in enough yeast cells, they might take off but only get about halfway done before they go dormant. So you want to make sure you've got a nice, healthy population of viable yeast cells, and that's called your cell count. One of the easiest ways to increase your cell count and double check that your yeast are healthy is by making a yeast starter. So I pulled off about a quart of wort, quart of wort, and we're gonna do what's kind of almost like a mini fermentation. I'm gonna boil that, I'm gonna chill that, I'm gonna put it in a one gallon fermenter. We're gonna shake the bejesus out of it so that it gets all that oxygen. I'm going to dump this in, and then for the next 24 hours, this yeast is going to multiply and continue to populate. And then tomorrow, when this is finally at proper temperature, I'm going to dump all of this back into the beer, and the yeast will have already finished reproducing and will have already eaten some sugars, and so they're perfectly primed and ready to go that when I introduce them to more sugar, they're just going to take off like bats out of hell. There's a few reasons besides increased cell count, like bats out of hell, there's a few reasons besides increased cell count why starters are good. One of them is if you're brewing a lager. We are brewing a lager. Lager tends to be happier at lower temperatures. Lower temperatures make the yeast perform slower. 
So if you give them twice as many yeast cells in their population, they're going to overcome that lag from temperature and continue on like normal. Another reason is if your yeast is out of date, which is our case here. So this yeast was used best before October 2020. So we're not that far off. Oh yeah, we are. 2020, that was over a year ago. I keep thinking it's 2021. So over a year. But it's dehydrated yeast and it lasts forever and I kept it in the freezer. This is the yeast company's, I don't know, it's almost like they, they, want, to, they want to say a number so that if you pitch this yeast a year later and it doesn't work, they can say, see, we told you it was only good until this time. But it's <laughs> the song of our people during these times. Yeah, that was rough. That was a rough moment for me. Um, this is also designed for five gallons and we're only doing three and a half. So that's also going to be in our favor. By doing the yeast starter, I'm going to also double check that this yeast is still good. So if by tomorrow when I'm ready to dump the yeast into this wort because the wort has cooled down and I don't see the level of activity that I should, I'll know, okay, this yeast was a bust. I'll probably pour it in anyway and then just add more yeast on top of that. We are already coming up to a boil, that's wild. Okay, so let's get going on this yeast starter. Uh, I'm off screen so you can't see, but I'm dumping that liter of wort into my smaller stock pot. I'm going to bring it up to boiling because boiling sanitizes the wort. So there probably won't be any microbes in this because it came out of uh, the mash and mash temperature is usually high enough to pasteurize. But just in case, I want to kill off any other microbes that could be present by boiling it for a couple of minutes. We're going to chill it down in my sink because it's only a liter of wort. It shouldn't take too long to chill. And then once it's chilled, we're going to move it into the fermenter, add the yeast, shake it down. We got a little bit extra wine in here. So, Nat class, what is the art project today? Are you given like a certain prompt or is it freestyle? Yep, we always have a prompt, varies in levels of complexity. Okay, cool. What is art accountability? First art challenge after a break, so the prompt today is just tattoos. I was gonna ask you, I forgot, if you've ever designed tattoos before. Because I think your art style would lend really well to a tattoo. Yep, 
you have a few times, you have a tattoo commission on the docket. That's awesome. I have a few tattoos myself, but I'm always looking for new ideas. Designed a handful of tattoos in the past, a smaller handful have actually taken in and gotten a tattoo. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that happens a lot. People have an idea, they get it drawn up. They maybe even book the appointment where you go and discuss it with the artist and then don't follow through. My girlfriend just got her first tattoo um, three weeks ago, four weeks ago now. All right, I just weighed out our Irish moss and our yeast nutrient. Irish moss is going to help us with beer clarity in the final product, and yeast nutrient is going to help the, uh, make sure that the yeast have everything they need. Ooh, I should also add some to the work starter. Art accountability. So my friend, and also a friend of Butler's, I like that you're calling him Butler now, that's fun, and I meet once a week. We talk about how the week went and what our goals for the next week are and what our larger goals for our art businesses is. Oh, cool. I get it. So it's like you're you're holding each other accountable to your own like goals and timelines. But well, if you see Brian before I do, tell him that my mom says hi. Please. All right, our wart starter is definitely boiling. I'm gonna pitch just a little handful of this, a little a little pinch, pitch a pinch of yeast starter into it, yeast nutrient I mean, man all these words are the same, yep because we both are self-employed need accountability, yeah for sure. You want a tattoo very much but you are wishy-washy, that happens, it's a commitment. I, I'm kind of at the point now, so I've gotten three tattoos that have deep, meaningful, stories behind them and uh, got them for very good reasons. And now I kind of want a shit tattoo. I want a random tattoo that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It just looks cool. Not shit that it looks bad, but shit that it like, it's like a toss away. It's random. Okay, so this yeast starter does not need to boil for very long, just a few minutes. The um, yeast nutrient that I put in there needs to boil for a few minutes too, so. Through seeing this silly temp, to temp tattoo on my arm is pushing me farther from wishy-washy. Temporary tattoos are great. Uh, one time I bought this Luna Moth temporary tattoo that was like this big, and I put it like right here. And that was awesome. It lasted like two weeks. I'm excited to see the tattoos that you made. Are they up on your store yet? All right, we're gonna turn off the starter. I'm gonna break my sink. No, we're not gonna break my sink. We are gonna fill the sink with cold water. Put the sanitizer on the lid. Now we're going to cover this bad boy up. 
and place it in the sink to chill. So you can see not very much liquid in there. And because it's not very much liquid and I can fill the sink much higher than the level of the wart, I don't think I'll need ice. I think I just need to get um, cold water a few inches above the level. Mine will not last that long. That's okay. Uh, I have like seven prints. I need to get up there first. Yeah, that's fair. Cool. We're going to let the yeast starter chill. So I think one of the I don't even want to call it challenging. Just one of the more important things about brewing is sanitation. And it can be difficult to wrap your head around it if you don't have experience with that before. Uh, I was fortunate enough to take a couple microbiology classes in college that included a microbiology lab where we actually grew cultures and learned how to sterilize things to grow certain cultures. Basically, you're gonna reach a certain point where you don't want anything that's not sterile and clean to touch this wart. So I poured a glass of sanitizer here, then I'm going to put my thermometer in so that when I check the temperature of the wart in a few minutes to see how cold it is, the, the thermometer has been sterilized. Well, sanitized. Sterile and sanitary are different. Um, pure Sanitization requires, I think it's like 99% of the microbes to be killed, whereas sanitation is only 95. I cleaned this very well, but we're also going to put sanitizer in here. I have too many things. Who's surprised? Not me. We're just going to put a little splash in there. I'm going to put the lid on. This type of sanitizer requires a two minute contact time. So we're going to make sure the inside of the lid gets some, all of the sides get some. We're not going to spill that much on the floor. Just some. The, the right amount to spill on the floor. This spray bottle has sanitizer in it as well, but it's almost empty. Oh no. This funnel doesn't fit in here. Well, just kidding. We'll pour it back into our jug. I also need to sanitize this funnel, so. This is all working out. Usually on my brew day streams, we don't do a whole lot of sanitation of fermentation vessels because I ferment in the keg with no chill, meaning that the wort is going in very close to boiling temperature, which is still hot enough to kill any microbe inside. So when you do a normal fermentation where you're putting your wort into a plastic bucket, plastic conical, metal fermentator, fermenter, fermentator. You want to make sure it's sanitized. Since this is just a miniature fermentation, that's what we're doing. We're getting some nice foam on top now. So we're definitely approaching the boil. This is definitely brown beer, which is good. That's what I was shooting for. 
So we can stir some of that foam back in, and now it's kind of starting to look like the foam on top of a latte, if I can get my spoon out of the way. temperature our starter is at. Oh, it's still hot. It's still steaming. Alright, what else do I need to prep? Oh, we need to get after we get the starter taken care of, we need to get the beer transferred from yesterday. golden ale from yesterday and again we're gonna put it on top of the yeast that's in this kit so we're doing yeast introduction yeast pitching in two different ways today we're doing our yeast starter that I'm gonna pitch tomorrow into this beer and then we're gonna reuse it's called the well you can't see my head anymore it's called the yeast cake gross term I don't like it I don't know why we have to call it that but when the yeast are done fermenting they sink to the bottom and they sediment to the bottom and it forms the yeast cake. So there's already an entire complete fermentation worth of yeast cells in that keg because I've already brewed a beer. So when I add this wort to it, it should take off pretty quickly because it doesn't have to go through that huge reproduction phase again. So it doesn't need to do the lag phase. It can kind of almost immediately go into primary fermentation. It's thinking about it. See this little patch here? Those are tiny bubbles coming up. All right, we sanitize our starter fermenter. We're chilling the starter wort. I'm gonna be pouring out of here into there. So I want to make sure that everything is sanitary. So this is when we also want to introduce Shake the Box. Hey Jim, what's up? Does the remaining yeast affect the flavor of the new batch at all? Sure. So beer flavor is typically about 70% because of the type of yeast that you use. In this beer that I'm making today, this honey lager, that's a little bit different because I'm using lots of really flavorful grains uh, that I am going to talk about later on what each of these grains is going to contribute. But in your typical beer, it's the yeast providing a lot of the flavor. When you think about something like a Hefeweizen or a Saison or a Belgian, all of those unique flavors for those styles because of the yeast. So the yeast that we're going to use is leftover from a batch of Kolsch that I made last time. Kolsch is a very clean ale yeast that is good at fermenting at low temperatures. So what it's going to do is it's going to allow the hoppy flavors of the beer that I brewed yesterday to really come through because they're not going to be covered up by any really strong yeast flavors. But a Kolsch yeast still produces some fruity esters and the Kolsch that I made ended up being kind of a fruity Kolsch. So those yeasts almost have like muscle memory of that fermentation 
And so they're probably going to resemble that beer that I made, which was very light, very crisp, a little bit of fruitiness, a little bit of citrusy notes. But I'm adding a super hoppy 40 IBU golden ale. So they're gonna almost meld together. The fruitiness and the hoppiness are gonna work really well together, I'm hoping. If I were pitching this onto um, pretty much any other strain of yeast, it would taste like a different beer. Those tastes might be subtle, like if I were using a British ale yeast versus an American ale yeast, there are some differences, but they're pretty similar. But if I were using Saison yeast, which are typically full of a lot of esters and phenols that the yeast produce in their fermentation, it's going to be really peppery, it's going to be clovey, it's going to be spicy. So unless I put in a beer with a lot of flavorful malts or a lot of flavorful hops, that beer is going to taste like that yeast. Uh, same with the Hefeweizen. Hefeweizen are known for very bubblegum and clovey tastes, and that 100% comes from the type of yeast that they use. So this yeast that we're putting into the honey lager, this is called California Common. This is an American lager yeast that was originated at Anchor Steam Brewing in San Francisco. So if you've ever had an Anchor Steam beer, they're the ones with like a pale yellow label, almost gold lettering, and then the bottle caps are like a bright teal blue. That is a very unique beer. The brewers of that beer completely made it up. It became super popular. It was in fact the first craft beer produced in the United States. And at the time, people didn't like it because they wanted Budweiser, Schlitz, Pabst. Anyway, that's a whole different story. But this yeast is derived, I have it upside down, not that that matters. This yeast is derived from that. So it's going to be a lager, technically, but it's not gonna taste like a German lager because I'm not using German lager yeasts. It's also not really gonna taste like Anchor Steam because I'm not brewing a beer that's Anchor Steam. So when you're thinking of the flavors that go into the beer, there are four contributors of flavor because there are four ingredients in beer. Water, grains, hops, and yeast. And all of those work together to make the flavor of the final product. Yeah, Anchor Steam is really good. It hits the spot. It's like bitter enough um, that it's not just a malt bomb, but it's not nearly as bitter as like a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, uh, which is also one of the first craft beers. And that came out maybe even 30 years after Anchor Steam started making California Common. The beer history of the United States is super interesting because pre-prohibition, hey child, granny, mama, are you still here? Are you paying attention? Butler, my mom is here. She made a twitch. Um, the history of beer brewing is super interesting and it started back in colonial times, but if we fast forward to like pre-prohibition, so end of 1800s, early 1900s, all of the main breweries in the United States were trying to make beers that re represented European lagers because those were the most popular beers in the world. The lagers from Pilsen in the Czech Republic, lagers from Bavaria in Germany, those were what everyone wanted to be drinking. So the precursors of the beers that we know now Budweiser, PBR, Miller, were created because they were trying to represent European lager. So when Anchor Steam came out, it's an amber brown beer. It is technically a lager, but it's not very light in flavor. And it's got a fair bit of maltiness to it. Everyone fucking hated it because it was nothing like those continental lagers that they were craving and were popular at the time. Um, but the owner of Anchor Steam, Fitz Maytag, he bought the brewery in San Francisco and just kept pushing the beer and would go from bar to bar and trying to sell this beer and eventually it became the most popular beer in San Francisco and then it became the most popular beer in California and then it just radiated out from there and it didn't really make it too far past the west coast because of 
transportation issues of the mid 19th century, 20th century. But I don't know. I think I think it was his dad or his uncle who was in the Maytag appliance business. We're starting to boil. Here she goes. So I'm gonna go ahead and start our timer. We're doing a 30 minute boil today. There we go, 30 minutes. We've already added our hops because we did that weird first wort hopping. So the only thing we have to do is 10 minutes from the end, I need to add the nutrients and the Irish moss. Okay, I need to check on the yeast starter. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, Nat class and Shake the Box, you're both Twitch streamers. That's fun, you should check each other out. Let's give a shout out. Shout out to Nat class. And Child Granny. So this is done chilling. Awesome, shake the box. Jim, you're so nice. I want to make sure this funnel is sanitized. We went through all that work to sanitize the fermentation vessel. So we want to make sure that everything touching the wort from here on out is sanitary. Sanitized jug. Sanitized foam. Chilled wort starter, yeast starter. Sanitized lid. Apparently I'm in a very hell yeah mood. <laughs> Nat class, that's great. That's excellent news. You can see this really thick foam on top. Those are all the proteins and starches and hazy compounds physically changing shape due to the increase in temperature to boiling, which is a good thing. This is what's referred to as the, as the hot break. And in a dark beer like this, it looks like a really good latte or espresso hot chocolate. So now we are going to introduce as much air and oxygen into this starter as we can. From what I was reading, you basically want to turn the whole thing into foam. So that's part of the reason that we have only one quart of wort, quart of wort in our gallon fermenter. It's going to take a minute. We are introducing most of the oxygen that the yeast are going to need for the next 24 hours.
Oh yeah, she's really boiling now. All right, after this, I'm gonna talk about the recipe and the grains and use the visual aids that I created this morning. You can use OBS like PowerPoint, right? Oh yeah, Shake the Box is a, uh, a duo streamer channel. Uh, Jimbo is one of the streamers. They definitely tend to do games. Um, you know, Jim, I feel like lately you've been playing a lot of fantasy stuff. You know, New World and Darkest Dungeon. I didn't catch Monster Hunter. Is that one also fantasy? And then your, your partner, Chris, I feel like lately he's been doing more puzzle stuff. Like that traffic game. No one's tired. You're tired. I started watching another streamer play New World Gym, and I'm ready. I think when Stream Deck comes out and they format the Steam controller configuration and I can just look it up because someone's already figured it out for me. But I was able to watch him from level one, so I got a better idea of what like the first five levels are like. Okay. Fuck it, I'm done shaking. Yeah, in that class I remember you saying you wanted to get that. Alright, so we're now going to introduce enough yeast for five gallons of beer into one quart of liquid. So, yeah, you guys should be able to see what the yeast looks like. It's just powdered. It's like when you buy baker's yeast in dehydrated form. in that class over things that you're really excited for. got a special hole drilled for it. So as this ferments, remember, when yeast ferment sugar, they produce alcohol and they produce CO2. If you don't give the CO2 somewhere to go, you're making a bomb. So this little device is going to allow CO2 bubbles to escape while no air or foreign objects or fruit flies or anything like that go into your wort. Everything is spraying the sanitizer because I'm paranoid. And now I'm going to go put this on top of my fermentation fridge. And every time I walk past, I'm going to give it a little swirl. But I want all the yeast to rehydrate first, or you end up with yeast stuck to the sides. So that was making my first ever yeast starter. Um, I think it went pretty well. We won't know until tomorrow. Uh, so let's talk about grains. So I mentioned that there are four things that go into the flavor of beer. And as luck would have it, they are the four main ingredients of beer. Um, so if you go back and watch the stream that I did yesterday or even the golden ale that I did last month, you'll notice that the hops are going to be a big factor of the flavor. And that's how that beer was designed. That beer was designed to be really light in multi grainy flavors to allow those fruity, citrusy, resiny hop flavors to really shine. So I used a yeast that was going to be really clean 
and not throw off a lot of strong esters like a Saison, a Belgian, or a Hefeweizen would. And so that's what we're doing again with the beer from yesterday. So I'm not using the yeast that I used a month ago, um, which was like the best golden ale that I've made so far. But I've got a keg full of perfectly good Kolsch yeast. And I'm a big fan of Kolsch yeast. Um, so we're going to try that. Oh, I just realized I need to have this keg ready. That's okay. We'll do it. It'll be fine. We've got time. All right, so let's talk about malts. Aha. So this is a basic flavor wheel of flavors derived, derived from grain, specifically malted barley. Now up in that, oh, this is the one problem is that I don't actually have PowerPoint. Up in this corner, in the very, very light yellow section, these are the flavors that are in all, almost all of the popular beer that's drinking. Um, all of the lagers like Pilsners, a lot of the light wheat beers, um, what other light color beers, cream ales. So the grains don't impart a lot of super strong flavors. It's just very basic cookie, biscuit, and bread. If you can see the black arrows, those black triangles, that corresponds to the color. So as we rotate from this top section here, if we go clockwise, you can't see my arm. If we go clockwise into the caramel section, where the caramel is very light, those are the types of flavor flavors. And then as it gets darker, there's more and more flavor imparted and different flavors imparted. So we're going from caramel more to like a toffee flavor. And then if we go even darker from that in the caramel section, we're on to like a toasted marshmallow flavor. So let's go clockwise again to the bottom to dried fruit. So if we included grains that were the colors of the black arrows, the black triangles, and we started at the lighter end, we would be imparting flavors that are like golden raisin, go a little bit darker, raisin, go a little bit darker, prune, and then all the way to the bottom, burnt raisin. So a lot of British beers have a lot of dried fruit flavors to them. A lot of Belgian beers have dried fruit flavors to them. Doesn't really show up as much in American beers. So then we're gonna go one more clockwise to toasty. At the lightest end of toasty, we've got toast, classic. Then we've got, what does that say? Dark toast, cappuccino, the harsh zone, we'll just ignore for now, it doesn't taste good. And then all the way at the bottom of toasty is cocoa. So not chocolate, cocoa, like straight cacao, like the bitterest chocolate bar you can get with zero sugar added. That's the type of flavor we're talking about. So then we're gonna go clockwise, clockwise one final time into roasty. So how do they make these colors? They start with base malt. They start with that light yellow and then they put them into a kiln, just like roasting coffee. The longer that they are kilned, the darker it gets. So you're gonna start at the inside of the circle and end up on the outside of the circle, depending on how long you go for and what the color change is. The main reason for the change in flavor is actual caramelization of the sugars in the grain. And another thing that's called Maillard reactions is the same reaction that happens when you cook a steak on cast iron and it gets that glazed texture to it that's almost sweet or when you reduce onions and they take on that almost burnt sweet flavor, that is also a Maillard reaction. So it's, it's a sweetening and an enhancing of the flavors at an actual chemical level. So let's go back up to roasty. All of those things to make darker were kilned. If you want roasted malt, you roast it. So once you start roasting malt, then it starts to take on characters similar to coffee go a little bit darker, similar to espresso, and then all the way at the darkest, similar, again, to chocolate, super dark chocolate. How does that jive with everyone? We good with that? And then remember, these are malts only. These are just the grains. We're not talking about yeast. We're not talking about hops. We're not talking about water. Just grains. Oh, no worry, Jim. Okay, on to the next PowerPoint presentation. Oh no, I did it wrong. Um, that one. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to start 
at the top of this list and work our way down because I'm very organized. So we're starting with two row malt, which is what's called organized but parched, which is called a base malt. It is providing the most basic flavor to your beer. The um, lagers, pilsners, that kind of stuff, they almost always have just base malt in them. And then they let the yeast and the hops kind of in the water carry where the flavor goes. So this is a different kind of flavor wheel where there's different descriptors around the edge. And then the middle of the circle is zero, the outer, the outer edge of the circle is five. So the manufacturer of this yeast sat down with professional taste testers and professional malsters and they tasted their malt and they filled out these circles of, all right, it's a three on sweetness, but it's a zero on graham cracker. And they went around all of these things and made, oh, thanks Jim, that's really nice. Um, and they made these wheels. So this is our first wheel, this is two row, super basic. This is what's providing the bulk of the sugars that the yeast are going to eat. So you can see next to two row, it says 77%. That's the composition of the grains of this beer. So this beer is 77% this stuff. So the next one is that 10 ounces of Munich two, which is at almost 11%. So this grain is made by a different manufacturer that gets way more specific with their flavor wheels. So the things that the Munich provides, provides sweet flavor, multi sweet flavor, and then the next highest ones are honey and bread. Now remember, it's not actual sweetness. The actual sweetness is sugar. This is perceived sweetness of your taste buds. So your taste buds on your tongue receive different compounds. And depending on the shape of that compound fits into a certain lock on your taste bud. And if the key fits correctly, then it fires neurons to your brain that says that tastes salty, that tastes sweet, that tastes umami, that tastes bitter. There's a fifth one. But it's all those, every food that we eat, every drink that we drink, that's how our taste bud is perceiving flavor. It is a lock waiting for a key to open it and fire the neuron. So this is not actual sugar. This is the perceived sweetness that sugar provides. Does that make sense? We still good? We're still jiving? So that's what the Munich brands brings. We've got basic bready flavor with some sweetness. On to the next. So the next one is honey malt. Honey malt is super unique because it actually imparts honey flavor. So you can see five out of five. Again, it's a different manufacturer, so a different wheel. Honey malt is five out of five honey, four out of five toast, and then kind of middling amounts of the other flavors. If you add honey to a beer, it's not going to make it taste like honey. What you are adding is a shit ton of super fermentable sugar and the yeast are going to eat all of the sugar or almost all of the sugar in the honey. It's not gonna taste like honey at all. It's actually going to taste super dry, like a very dry wine, but beer. So if you want your beer to taste like honey, you have to add this special honey malt. Now it can be overpowering, so that's why it's at a pretty low percentage, 5.3%. So we've got basic breadiness, perceived sweetness, honey, but not the sweetness of honey, just the floral aspects of the taste of honey with a little bit of toast. And now onto the next one that's gonna provide all the reason that, oh, you can't see the beer anymore. The reason that the beer is brown and hopefully a lot of the flavor, and that is, the chocolate rye. So in this one, we've got bitter. So this is a roasted malt. Remember, they put it through a kiln like roasting coffee beans. Yes, I'm still listening, YouTube. Come on. Why does honey work so well for mead and not beer? I'll get back to that. That's a great question. 
So chocolate rye is roasted, so it's, it's a darker malt, that's where the color comes from. The flavor contributions of the chocolate rye, looks like we've got a little bit of sour, bitter, coffee, cocoa, dark chocolate, roast, almond, bready. Those are the big ones that stand out to me. So we've got basic bready grain, perceived sweetness, honey flavor, and then coffee, cocoa, bitter, nutty, a little bit of sour. And that is the flavor profile that we're going for on this beer. Is it gonna be good? I don't know, I've never made this beer before. <laughs> this is 100% totally made up. All right, I need to add the Irish mass and the yeast nutrients. We're at 10 minutes in our boil. So mead is generally 100% honey. It's been a long time since I've had mead. Um, it, there probably is some residual flavor of honey, but again, so there's, there's different types of sugar, right? There's sucrose, fructose, glucose, maltose, and yeast are really good at fermenting some of those better than others. And the type of sugar that's in honey is, I believe, sucrose. It might be glucose. Yeast is really, really good at fermenting that. So it's going to take almost all of the sugar out and you're going to be left with a really dry beverage. So it may resemble the flavor of honey because it is 100% honey going into that beverage, but unless you um, it's called back sweetening. Unless you add sweetness to the final product, it's going to be super dry. Um, so if we, when we are brewing, when we're brewing things, doesn't matter if it's mead or wine or beer or cider, you want to start, you want to know how much sugar you're starting with and you want to know how much sugar you're ending with when the yeast are done eating it. And that tells you a couple different things. That tells you how much alcohol is in it. But also, depending on that final number, so the gravity of water is 1, this beer is probably going to end at 1.009, hopefully. So it's not going to be very sweet. There are a lot of ciders and meads that end back around 1. There's almost zero residual sugar left. Is that good? Does that make, does that make sense? Um, and then when you back sweeten, you actually kill off your yeast so that they can't ferment anymore. And then you add a specific amount of sweetener back, whether that's honey or sugar or fruit juice or whatever. And because the yeast are dead, they're not going to ferment that additional sugar anymore. So it'll raise back up in sweetness and stay there. some work on these kegs so that I have a place to put this beer. Saber is Henry. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate you, man. Come on in. Saber, how is your day going today? I hope it's a great one. All right, we need to sanitize our funnel. No problem, this is interesting, doing well, thanks. Oh yeah, that's your actual brother? That's awesome. Well, I'm a big fan of Jimmy's channel. And I'm just happy you guys are here chatting about beer. It's one of my favorite topics ever. So, this is the beer I'm brewing today. Here's the recipe for it. It's a honey lager. 
Yesterday, I brewed a golden ale. <laughs> Dude, I've learned so much today. Thanks, man. That's, that's really nice to hear. I appreciate it. Um, yesterday, I brewed a golden ale that is super hoppy, um, but only like 40 IBUs of bitterness. So it's going to be as bitter as like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, um, but it's very light in color, and it's going to have a lot of hop aroma and flavor. So that's still in this keg. And this is the keg that I'm actually going to ferment it in that has the yeast in it. So we got to transfer it over. So I've sanitized my funnel. If I'm distracted when that timer hits zero, will you guys tell me? I'll maybe notice the chat before I notice the timer. Appreciate it. Um, so I sanitized the funnel. We're going to open up the one that has the yeast in it, put the funnel on top, and then we're going to open up this keg and pour it in. He is my brother. That's awesome. All right, I'm also gonna sanitize the top of this keg. Maybe. Need more sanitizer. So there's a hundred different ways to brew beer and you can make it, oh God. You can really make it as simple as you want or as complicated as you want. Black Storm 450, I thought you were brewing coffee. We're brewing beer. That's what we do. We're Snail House Brewing. So when you first when you first start brewing, it's gonna be really simple. You're gonna buy malt extract that already has extracted all the sugar for you. You are going to put it in. Ah, oh, Blackstorm, thanks for the follow, man. That's awesome. Um, I'm actually, like, slowly working my way up to affiliate. I think I officially have, like, 40 followers now. So I really appreciate it. Every, every follow is super important to me. Um, you're going to buy malt extract. You're going to buy hops. You're going to buy yeast. You're going to come home. You're going to throw the malt extract in a big pot with some water. You're going to boil it. You're going to throw the hops in. And then you're going to transfer it to probably a plastic bucket. You're going to put the yeast in it. You're going to let it ferment for a couple weeks. One week, two week. Got to get affiliate two to sweet. Working on it. Working on it. Um, and then you're going to either bottle it or keg it. Most home brewers start by bottling. Bottles are free. They come with the beer that you buy at the store. So you buy a couple of 12 packs, however much beer you've made, drink the bottles, clean them out, sanitize them. You buy bottle caps, transfer your beer into the bottles, cap them, wait another couple of weeks for it to carbonate. And that's really it. Um, if you guys want, I could do a malt extract recipe that's like designed for beginners. And we can go through it that way too. I've started doing, so what I do is called all grain brewing where I buy the grains. And that's just because I really like building recipes and flavors because there's so many different types of malted grains in the world. Um, but brewing with extract is just as viable and it's way easier and you will still make good beer. Okay, this one has the yeast in it. And CO2. Are my alerts too loud? I don't know how to turn them down. I use Streamlabs if that helps. two inches of super uh well i drank the beer that was in here and you use co2 to push the beer out of the keg so as the liquid dissipates it's being replaced by co2 
So I had to, this is, that was a pressurized vessel, this one will be too. So you have to release the pressure out before you can open it. 30 seconds, we can do it. And then I'm gonna put my sanitized funnel in the hole. I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait so I don't have to do 100 things. The gas releasing noise. Uh, that was the CO2 coming out of the keg. Zero! All right, we're gonna turn off the flame, turn off our timer, and then we're gonna let this sit for like 10, 15 minutes while I do this other shit. Okay. We can do it. We're not gonna spill anything on my floor. We might spill some things on my floor. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Oh, it smells happy. It smells good. Yeah, okay. Three and a half gallons, a gallon of water is eight pounds. This is like what, 30 pounds? sanitize the edge one more time that the beer is going to actually touch. So when you start brewing bigger and bigger batches, the amount of liquid becomes bigger and bigger, right? And eventually, like commercial breweries use pumps and hoses to move all their liquid around. And there are some home brewers that uh, use pumps as well. I'm cheap and I live in a small apartment that doesn't have a lot of storage. So here's the golden ale that I brewed yesterday, the video is up on my channel if you want to watch. I spilled so much on my shoe! We got a little bit of sediment in the bottom, which is totally normal, and we were expecting that. Okay. Put that in here. Put our lid back on the top. We're also going to put the lid back on the top of the other one so it stays sanitized. Okay. So now we're at the point. Have one when you pop on later. Wish I could see the yeast cake. Probably should have taken a picture. Um, I'll post one I'll, mm, next time. I'll post a picture to your Discord. How about that? Um, or what I could probably do is post a picture of the yeast starter tomorrow. Will it be? We'll figure it out. Okay, so now is the point where you want to introduce a lot of air because the yeast need air for the beginning parts of fermentation. My funnel has a screen in it, which is good because we captured a lot of junk. I don't know if you can see that. And that screen aerates the wort as it goes down. But just to make sure, I'm also gonna roll the heck out of it.
pressure there. It's got yeast, it's got wort. The yeast are gonna start taking off pretty quickly. So I'm gonna move it into the fermentation fridge, which is unfortunately that way. And then we'll come back to do the rest of this. Uh, I am going to take this top off. Not the lid, but the pressure release valve that I keep pulling. Because remember, we're emitting CO2 at a pretty quick rate. If I leave the, pot, the top on, we're making a pressure bomb. So the gold nail is off and running. It'll probably be done fermenting with that much yeast. It might be done in like four days, uh, but we're gonna wait a little bit longer than that to add the dry hop addition because I'm fermenting these at the same time and this one might take longer. What would they do with a big giant tank to air it? Do you mean like a tank of oxygen? Oh, if you were at a brewery. Um, and they use a giant tank to ferment in. They usually pump in oxygen, whether that's with a giant oxygen tank with a valve, and then you run like a tube and a little aeration stone at the end of it, and fill it full of pure oxygen, and it takes a few minutes. Or you can buy like an aquarium pump that's meant for aerating. They obviously buy much bigger than an aquarium pump, but the same kind of idea. It's forcing pressurized air through the liquid, and that's introducing oxygen in that way. All right. So we gotta do a conversion real quick. And this keg should be completely sanitized because I put boiling temperature wort into it yesterday. It cooled down overnight uh, thanks to our super low winter temperatures. So nothing unsanitary has touched this keg. This should still be totally clean. In terms of microbes, like there's definitely beer in the bottom of it still, uh, but we're going to add this, and this is still really hot. You can see it's steaming. Can you go over the grains you're using for this one you're, that you're fermenting again? Oh, uh, the one from yesterday? Yeah, that's, so this is the recipe for today. The one from yesterday I can pull up for sure. I just gotta uh, get this stuff done. So kegs are pretty simple. They've got a gas in and a liquid out. So you put CO2 down one side and then you draw beer out of the other. So this is the part 
part here that we're replacing, this is a dip tube that goes all the way to the bottom of the keg and draws up liquid, liquid from the bottom. But since I'm going to be fermenting and serving from this keg, when it's done fermenting, all of the yeast is going to drop to the bottom. So if I've got this tube in there drawing liquid out, all I'm going to draw is yeast. Oh, I cleaned this. There it is. So what we're going to use instead is what's called a floating dip tube. Yeah, I can absolutely do that, Jim. No worries. Like I said, uh, once I get this beer transferred, I'm just a little bit on a time crunch. Not that big time crunch. Just a little one. Alright, so this is our new dip tube. It's very little. And then we're going to add our post. Stop on top. are covered in grease. It's food safe grease, don't worry. Alright, and then we're going to use this floating dip tube. So this is cut so that it'll touch the bottom. I don't want to touch the floor because the floor is dirty. And it's going to attach to that short little post that we just put in. It's got a stainless steel float and then a uh, HDPE plastic and stainless mesh filter. So it's going to rest on top of the liquid. And then when it's done fermenting and I go to draw a glass of beer, as the level of liquid lowers, because this is floating on the surface, this is just going to follow it all the way to the bottom until the keg is empty. And that way we won't suck up any of the yeast trub that's on the bottom. Uh, these can be kind of a pain to put on the... You have to like feed it on to a tube that's just the right size blind. Which is why I heated it up in the warp because that's still hot. And that tube is made out of silicone so we can handle hot pressure, or excuse me, hot temperature. Alright. Looking good. We got that. We got that. We don't need this anymore. <laughs> you never have to apologize for having a good time. Okay, now you might ask yourself, how are we going to get super hot brown lager into a sanitized ready keg? I'll tell you. Bring my damn towel over. Put that so you can kind of see it. Okay. So I use what's called very carefully. Yeah, truly. Yesterday I was doing this in flip flops. Hot wort on bare feet, no good. Um, I use what's called no chill brewing. So most commercial brewers and most home brewers would now chill this down using a chiller to the temperature that the yeast thrive best at, the temperature that you're going to ferment at. But I'm using no chill. So what we're going to do is we're going to care very carefully move this super hot wort down into this keg 
without splashing. So this keg is made out of stainless steel and I don't know what the rubber is, but it can, the point is it can handle super hot temperatures. It's not going to rupture, it's not going to burst. I'm going to seal this up, put a little bit of CO2 on it, and then it's going to go out on my front porch until tomorrow mid-morning when it's finally down into the 60s Fahrenheit. Hopefully by then our yeast starter will have taken off and then tomorrow when they're both ready, I'm going to add the yeast starter back into this and then pop it in the fermentation fridge. So this wort is still hot enough that it's going to kill any microbes. So even if I have accidentally introduced bacteria by talking over this open keg, this is hot enough that it's going to lice all those cells. Yeah, please bring your dad. While I'm doing this, Jim, I know you really like dark beers, um, brown, stouts, Guinness. Uh, what about you, Saber? What kind of beers are you into? My floor is sticking. Where is it? My shoe. My shoe might be sticky. Uh, I am mostly self-taught on the brewing stuff. Stouts and porters, nice. Uh, I'm going to do, for St. Patrick's Day, I'm going to do an oyster stout. I'm really excited about it. I've never made one before. I've drank one on a very successful St. Patrick's Day in 2012. I think. Usually I like IPAs and pails um, and like that golden ale. This, that's like the fourth time that I've made it. It's so good. It's so fucking good. And it's like, it's completely crushable because it's only four and a half percent alcohol. It's bitter enough to be bitter, but it's not going to blow your taste buds like a super IPA. Um, I really like to make session beers that are like below 5% ABV. Very rarely do I go above 6%. I would just, I'd rather have half a dozen over an evening than two or three and then be completely conked because there's so much alcohol in it. Yeah, I keep brewing like summer beers in the middle of winter, but that's what I like. What are you going to do? No one just flicked hot wort into their face. Okay, buddy. We're going to have to talk about this later and how you never cooperate when I'm live on the internet. There we go. Alright, so we're going to utilize what's called, if you like, Northeast IPAs a lot. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of those. But that's okay. I'm glad that they exist and I'm glad that people out there like them. So we're going to utilize a gravity siphon in the box. So this is a stainless steel, stainless steel, stainless steel tube connect, connected to silicone tubing. So these are both heat resistant. In the bottom of this is a glass ball, heat resistant, and a metal spring, heat resistant. I'm going to push this racking cane down in the liquid. That's going to force the ball up, and the liquid is going to enter the tube. Then I'm going to lift. The glass ball is going to fall and it's going to trap whatever liquid we already have in here. I'm going to do it again. We're going to get more liquid. I'm going to do it again and we're going to get more liquid until the majority of this tube is filled with hot wort. Then I'm going to very carefully put this tube into the bottom of the keg so that we don't splash, but the weight of the liquid in the tube will be enough to start the gravity siphon, theoretically. Um, I'm going to make an easily jiffable hand motion. Now, I'd just really appreciate it if we were cool about it, guys. This beer is dark in color, so you can actually see it in the tubing. The one that I did yesterday was super light. Pop 
Talk amongst yourselves, I guess. This will take a minute. Oh, you already are. Constantine. Nice. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Is that Keanu Reeves, or is that a different one? I want more, more liquid. Okay, we're gonna see if that's good enough. All right, so now I have to work pretty quickly. You can kind of see the difference in color, um, and hopefully that'll be enough liquid to start our gravity cycle. Crush it. So you can hear that glass ball spinning. That tube is all the way down at the bottom, so it's filling from the bottom up. We're not splashing and introducing air. And I'm just gonna very carefully keep the tip of this tube at the top of the liquid and follow it down as it empties so that all of the sediment and hazy starchy compounds sink to the bottom. We're not gonna suck those up. First time on my channel, welcome from Sunfire. I stream almost every day, um, mostly video games, but then a couple of times a month, I'm um, hoping to do four times this month, I live stream home brewing beer in my tiny apartment kitchen. Uh, and we hang out and talk about beer and talk about how beer is made and brewing history and why different beers taste the way that they do, and I don't know, it's a good time. We get a little science-y, we get a little artsy. Oh, I never answered your question about being self-taught. Um, for the brewing stuff, I was self-taught. I had a lot of free time during the pandemic, um, but I have a pretty strong science background because I have a Bachelor's of Science in Zoology. So when I was in college, I took things like uh, organic chemistry, biochemistry, microbiology, ecology, um, all those things that actually apply more to home growing than I do in my day job as a zookeeper, which is kind of funny. All right, we're gonna now move this really hot tube to the sink. talking so much I got distracted. Let's see if this will work. It might be it might be too thick. Oh you know what I'm actually gonna use my uh, digital hydrometer for this one so we'll check that but it won't matter. I'm not currently working um, but the last place that I worked was at a safari park in California called Safari West. And then before that, I was an animal ambassador keeper at Bush Gardens Williamsburg in Virginia. Some people don't know what that is. Out of work right now, which is why I stream to Twitch almost every day. <laughs> but we're getting closer to affiliate. That's so badass. Thank you. It, uh, it's a very rewarding job, that's for sure. And uh, like the last animals I was working with at the safari park were huge African antelope, zebra. I was the primary rhino trainer. I worked with uh, a lot of cows. The cows were actually some of my favorite. So, so we can't be stupid and do this confirm. Yes, you can, because I'm going to teach you now. This is a CO2 tank. 
I won't lead you astray, Jimbo. Like I said, you can make this process as simple as you want, and you can make this process as complicated as you want. There are some aspects to this process that even I find super intimidating, so I don't really dive deep into those topics as much as I do with the stuff that I understand, or at least the stuff that I can teach myself. Think about it. People have been making beer since ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Sumeria. They had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea that yeast existed. They mixed a bunch of stuff in a pot, brought it to a certain temperature, and said a prayer to the goddess Ninkasi. And they truly thought that it was divine intervention that turned the liquid they put in that pot into an alcoholic beverage. So if they can do it, I'm pretty sure you can do it. Okay, so at this stage, we don't want any air or oxygen to touch our wart yet. So what we're gonna do, and again, this is really only specific to fermenting in a keg or no chill brewing. This kind of stuff won't really matter when you're doing entry level brewing in a bucket. So we're gonna put a couple pounds of pressure into our keg. Let's see. My son would talk to you about animals till your ears fell out. If you give me beer. <laughs> Talking to kids about animals was definitely one of the perks of zookeeping and interacting with the public. Alright, this is gonna be a little loud. Or not, just kidding. Alright, so we've now put about six psi. CO2 in here, but this was previously filled with air, so we're going to purge. We now have approximately half the air that we had is now replaced by CO2, so we're at 50-50. Purge it a second time. We now have a quarter of the remaining air the rest is replaced by CO2. Third time, an eighth of the amount of air. See what we're doing here? Law of gases and the like. I was terrible at physics in college though, I can tell you that. Uh, what did I say? Eighth? Now we're at one sixteenth. We're going to do this two more times so that we're down to approximately 164th the beer that we had, which is a pretty small percent. There's the loud noise. Okay, so now we're at 164th. We're going to fill it with CO2 and leave it. So now that I know that there's mostly CO2 in this keg, we're going to flip it upside down. And now we're not splashing with air, which is the opposite of what we did with the other keg. We wanted air. We're flipping it upside down. 
so that the hot wort that is hot enough to sanitize is now reaching the top of the keg. So we got the bottom of the keg sanitized, we flip it over, now we're sanitizing the top of the keg. It's going to sit there, I don't know, five minutes and then I'll move it out to my porch. And we did it. Tomorrow I'm going to pitch the yeast. But we did it. Here's i like to show you guys what the hops look like. We, we didn't use any fucking hops in this one, hardly. But here's all the hops compacted in the bottom. And then here's what we left behind. Remember I said all of the heavy, hazy, starchy compounds sunk to the bottom and that's where we wanted to leave them. Gross. I don't want to drink that. So we left that behind. Oh, I need a beer. It's almost three. It's a Friday. Okay. Work, work, work. Cheers. Jimbo, you want to talk about the recipe? Let's do that. Um, let me see if I got a decent reading on this or not. It might be too dirty. Oh, okay. 47, we ran with the 46. My dad really likes brown beers, but especially brown lagers. So this beer is brewed for him. He's going to be here in a couple of weeks. It might be ready by then. If not, I'll drink it without him. But what I wanted was the malt complexity and smoothness of a brown ale with a little bit of like roasty, toasty bitterness cocoa, coffee flavor, but then brewed as a lager because lagers are super smooth, super drinkable. Um, like that's why you can crush a 12 pack of Coors Light because it's super easy to drink. Uh, it's not, you know, the best tasting beer, but it is crushable. You can't deny me that. So typically amber lagers are very popular and dark lagers are very popular. You don't see a whole lot of brown lagers. There's one, and it's a type that my dad really, really likes, and I made it for him uh, the last time he was here, and that's called a Munich Dunkel. Munich is in Germany. It's a super traditional German, straightforward recipe. Now, some people like to give me shit for drinking Coors Light. It's like, no, it's delicious, and they wouldn't make so much of it if people weren't buying it. You know? So the Munich Dunkel was really good. And it, it was a recipe that I created, but there were hundreds of years of tradition and um, historic recipes to kind of build off of. This one, I wanted something completely different. I wanted it to be like the love child of a brown ale and a lager. So this is why I chose what I did. If I were doing a real traditional German beer, instead of using two-row, I would use what's called Pilsner malt. It's the same type of like Pilsner beer. Pilsner beer is like 95% Pilsner malt, uh, which is actually named after a town in the Czech Republic, Pilsen, where Pilsner was first brewed. Fun fact for you. But Germans are very straightforward with their beer. They use base malts, and they very rarely use specialty malts unless they're making a dark beer. Almost all the flavor comes from those very basic malts, the flavor profile of the yeast, the water, and even the hops that they use are super reduced. Oh yeah, Dungles, fucking delicious. I'm a huge fan. 
So I went with two row. It's an American grain. It's the base grain that I use in almost all my recipes. I know it. I've used it. I know it's going to work well for me. So that's why we went with two row. Um, and I can get the, you want the flavor wheels back up too? So there's the sensory profile of the two row. Um, and this is, this is pre-fermented. So once the yeast have their way with it, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. But anyway, we've got sweet, we've got a little bit of toast, looks like a little bit of grainy, a little bit of malty. So like I said, this is a, a base malt that I'm very familiar with, and that's why I chose that. Munich is a German malt. And Munich is the malt that they use in Oktoberfests and Marzens. And um, if you ever have an amber lager like Dos Equis Amber, um, is actually a traditional German beer. A lot of Germans moved from Germany into Mexico and South America and took their, Germ their brewing traditions with them. Um, and Texas, actually, a lot of traditional Texan beers are inspired by German beers. So that's why Bach, um, Shiner Bach, is a super German beer made in Texas. Um, so Munich malt provides um, a little bit of color and it provides like an orangey color like Oktoberfests are. And so if you look at our flavor wheel, we also have that perceived sweetness, the malty sweetness. Oh, I hate this song, it's got fake siren in it. And then a little bit of breadiness. So, I knew I wanted this beer to be brown, and I knew I wanted it to have roasty, toasty, coffee, cocoa flavors, but I didn't want it to be super bitter. I just wanted it to be really full. So the sweetness of the Munich is going to provide fullness to the mouthfeel, if that makes sense. Like the difference between drinking skim milk versus water, or like 2% milk versus skim milk. There's just a little, it's a little more full. Um, so that's what the Munich is going to provide. And then the honey malt provides that honey flavor, but not the honey sweetness. So to me, honey is super floral, like even clover honey. Um, but it's not going to be overpowering. Instead, I'm imagining it's going to bring like a, an herbal note to kind of back up the sweetness and the roastiness, if that makes sense. And again, we're just kind of like rounding out the flavor. We started with basic, we built a little bit on it, now we're building another element to it. And then finally where, oh gosh, I know you guys can't see it, but it drives me crazy. Um, finally, the malt that's gonna provide a lot of the flavor, even though we're only at 5.3%, is the chocolate rye. So the chocolate is a roasted malt, roasted exactly like coffee beans, right? They start out as green, they end up as that dark black. Um, so the chocolate rye is going to bring bitter, coffee, cocoa, dark chocolate, roasted almond, and bready. So if you ever have like a, like a nut brown ale, sometimes they actually put nuts in it, but more often than not, they're using a malt like this that provides that like nutty overtone without actually being made of nuts. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I feel like I'm in like art school defending my project right now. <laughs> I did put some thought into, to, into it. When you're, at least for me, and I'm, I'm still pretty new at this, I started April of 2020. So like, we're coming up on two years of home brewing. The first few beers I made were fucking terrible. I thought I knew how to design a recipe, but I had to step back use already proven recipes from the internet and then what you really need is an understanding of the ingredients you need to look up these flavor wheels you need to read from the manufacturer what this is going to impart in the beer and it's a lot like cooking like if your food is already salty don't add more salt if you want your food to be garlicky you have to add garlic like it's it's almost as simple as that but you have to get familiar with the terms and you have to get familiar with the ingredients. And then as far as yeast goes, I knew I was going to use a lager yeast and then I actually had a friend from the UK send me a couple of yeast packs um, and one of them was a California common lager yeast and I thought 
that's fucking perfect. California Common is a high, is a high, oh, you can't see this other hand, is a hybrid beer because it kind of floats that line between an ale and a lager, which is what I'm going for. You can ferment it at ale temperatures, which is going to be great because I'm fermenting it at the same time as the golden ale. And the flavor profile is going to, is going to be good. I don't know exactly what that is. Estery, some fruity esters, but not a lot. And like I said, lagers are just really crisp. They're really crisp and really smooth. Um, I don't know, we're gonna find out in two weeks how it actually turns out. The hop that I use down here, Triumph, is technically an American hop, but again, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a German lager. I'm trying to make the, the birth the baby of a, a American brown ale and an amber European lager. Jimmy, thanks for the follow, Jimmy. I really appreciate it. How's your day going? What's your favorite kind of beer? Do you even like beer? So Triumph hops are bred from German hops. So their pedigree is German, but they're still very much an American hop. Uh, and I just, I really like Triumph. They are only grown by one hop grower in the United States up in Yakima Valley. They're named for the motorcycle company. Who doesn't love that? Um, and I've used them before in the Kolsch that I make. I always use Triumph Pops, which is pretty sacrilegious. Usually when you make a German beer, you use German ingredients to a T. Uh, but I want to I do it my way. And I entered that Kolsch into a Kolsch competition. It was the first time I had brewed it. I made up the recipe. And on a scale of 0 to 50, I ended up scoring a 39. You were a beer brewer. I'm doing good. You're in Puerto Vallarta right now. Just came from a tequila farm tour. That's awesome. You were a beer brewer. Were you commercial or home brewer? You were head brewer for two years. Love this. How's it sounding? Like, am I, am I close? <laughs> like I said, I've only been doing this for a little bit less than two years. I'm 100% self-taught when it comes to all of the brewing aspects. Um, but yeah, welcome in. I'm Sunfire. I stream every day, most, almost every day, mostly video games. But then three or four times a month, I have started live streaming home brewing beer in my tiny kitchen we can get rid of the malt wheels now though i do i think this one's really important i think when you're when you're learning commercial were you at a brewery that we would recognize we were just talking about um mexican and south american beers and how they were some part influenced by traditional german beers uh, which i find super interesting um no worries, man. I've just been yapping away. When you're learning, when you're learning to taste beer, so like there are people who are just beer tasters and they learn like through the Cicerone program or they learn through the beer judge certification program how to taste beer like there are professional wine tasters. And so if you're starting to get into that world of talking about beer and comparing beers to each other, I think it's, it's really important to learn the proper vocab. And so there are some really useful books out there. This one came from Tasting Beer by Randy Mosher, um, which is like the Bible when you're learning how to drink beer, which like sounds stupid. Um, but this is his malt flavor wheel. And I think, uh, like I said, it's a really great stepping stone for learning why does this malt taste different than this malt? Why is this malt darker? Um, you know, when we're talking about caramel malts, which are really, really common in American beers, why is light caramel different from toasted marshmallow caramel, you know? You gotta learn to drink beer. You, I'm also self-taught on drinking beer. Well, you guys have any other questions? I'm happy to hang out. I want to hear more about, um, Jim, about your brewing career. Taught myself on how to drink too. Listen, it's an important life skill. That's what some of us learn mostly in college. Yeah, there's a degree in there too somewhere. Oh, is my mom still watching?
<laughs> she was nice enough, and my aunt and my dad uh, have all made Twitch accounts to follow me. Which is so nice. Gotta love family. You can do it, Jim. I know you can do it. You're a smart guy. And you, I think, I think passion and motivation is such a big part of it. Because you have to be patient. You have to be somewhat detail oriented when it comes to like cleaning and sanitizing. Um, and you gotta be able to follow a recipe. You have to run Saber. It was so nice meeting you, man. Nice chatting with you as well. Uh, I gotta drink all this beer before I can brew again. Um, so the next one may not until may not be until like the end of January, early February. Depends on if this beer is ready for when my dad is in town and how much we drink it. <laughs> but you guys can do it. If you guys want me to do, I'll, Jim, I'll talk to you during your next stream, probably, if you want me to do a basic beer. I'm happy to do it. It still makes really good beer. Optimus Prime. Are you, are you going to make hoppy beers, though? Because if I showed up to a brewery called Optimus Prime and it was all browns and stouts, I think I would be a little, a little, little uh, misled. Okay, I think I'm gonna end it unless you guys have any other questions. Uh, I'm gonna move this keg outside. All the beers named after Transformer characters. Yeah, Bumblebee would be the best one. All the Decepticons are like scary names though. Make mead. There you go. There's a mead called uh, Viking's Blood. I don't know what it's flavored as, why it's called Viking's Blood, uh, but another streamer was telling me about it. She hates beer, but she still comes and hangs out for these homebrews because she's very nice. <laughs> she's very supportive. All right, I'm gonna move this keg outside, put a thermometer on it so I can monitor. I'm gonna come back and if you guys have more questions, awesome. But if we're done, that's also awesome. I'm gonna start cleaning up and maybe start playing some Witcher. Have a good one, Saber. Nice to meet ya. Jimbo, are you streaming later? Or do you take do you take Fridays off? I feel like you normally would be streaming by now. Unless you've been streaming and watching at the same time, which would be impressive. Uh, let's see how the starter looks. So this is a very good sign. Um, most of the yeast has dissolved, not all of it, but do you remember when I put sanitizer in this airlock and the levels on both sides were equal? They are definitely not equal anymore. So this yeast is already pushing CO2 out of this vessel. And we put this in maybe an hour ago. So this is going to get real thick and creamy, in a, in a good way. So I'm gonna let that ferment in that tiny jug for overnight into tomorrow. Tomorrow, by mid morning, 
the wort should be chilled down to fermentation temperature, which is going to be 64 Fahrenheit. And if that yeast looks bubbly and thick and healthy, then I'm just going to pitch the whole thing into the beer. Um, if not, I'm going to have to run to the homebrew shop and buy some lager yeast because I didn't buy any backup yeast. <laughs> I put so much beer on this guy. Oh man, so many people are streaming right now. Should we raid someone? I think I'm just about done. Like I said, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking about beer until the cows come home. Uh, but while we've got a bit of a crowd and a little bit of momentum, maybe we'll go raid. Oh, which I can't do for my phone, which drives me crazy. Twitch doesn't let you do anything from your phone. Yikes. My laptop does not want to open that while streaming. I should stop touching things. Oh, so I'm also going to add to this beer, um, I'm going to use my digital hydrometer. So, you remember me? putting samples onto this refractometer and, and looking through it and getting a gravity reading. So it's really important for tracking your yeast fermentation, what gravity you're starting at, meaning how much sugar you start with, and then what your final gravity is going to be, how much sugar is left when the yeast are done. The digital hydrometer, I just toss it into the beer when I add the yeast and it floats and it floats at the top and it's weighted in a certain way so that if it's in water of a gra specific gravity of one, it's mostly straight up and down. And then as the gravity of the beer increases, meaning there's more sugar, it starts to tilt. And the angle of the tilt corresponds to what the gravity of the beer is. So you toss it in at the beginning of fermentation, you find out what your original gravity is, and then as the yeast digests sugar and ferment your wort, it's gonna slowly start tilting back to a neutral position. And the cool thing about it is that it will talk to any Bluetooth device that you have the app. So I've got my Amazon tablet with the app loaded, and so the tilt hydrometer is constantly talking to my tablet and giving it data points of time, temperature, and gravity. So I will actually end up with a graph of my fermentation over time. And then when it bottoms out, when it gets to its ending gravity, and it stays there for two or three days, you know that the beer is done. And it's such a lifesaver. It's such a really cool piece of tech. Uh, the way they designed it, it's super clever, and I'm a big fan of it. I highly recommend it. it it is a little spendy. Uh, I got mine. I got mine for free, and that's maybe why I like it so much. Um, but it's it's really nice to have that data, so you can check on your yeast health if that makes sense. Okay. Open up the Twitch. We're gonna raid. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me for another brew day here at Snail House Brewing. Uh, where we made our honey brown lager. It is officially brown in color. Like I said, I have to drink all this beer <laughs> before I can brew again. So give me a couple weeks. You know, it's, it's seven gallons of beer. And I will definitely be streaming the next one. I don't know yet what I'm going to brew. I usually try to do something hoppy and something either dark or malty um, to kind of balance it out. Oh, I, I'm definitely going to do a oyster stout for St. Patrick's Day. 
Um, so that might be kind of mid-February when I do that. So we'll see when it when it when the timing hits. Um, but if you wish you were live, we got distracted by you. <laughs> that is a huge compliment. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I'm looking for someone to raid if you want to get going. If not, we're going to raid my friend B Sweezy. Um, she and her friends play Fortnite and some other shooters. It looks like she's just chatting right now, but she's super awesome, and her whole crew of streamers are super awesome. Um, they've There's some other streamers like Nat Class that have kind of shown me the ropes of Twitch uh, and what, what I should do and, and how alerts work. Um, so I'm going to brew again. i got to drink this beer. Thank you so much for being here. I really super appreciate it. Thank you to all the new followers. Um, slowly creeping up towards affiliate. So every follow is a huge deal and I really, really appreciate it. Stream manager. Any last words, Jimbo? I wish I was live. Man, I'm gonna screenshot that. That, uh, that makes me happy. That warms, warms the cockles of my heart. Also, why doesn't Twitch let you do anything on your phone? <sighs> Riddle me that, Twitch. I know how this works. My computer can definitely handle all of these things at the same time. Oh, my laptop right now. Ugh, you're just making me blush with compliments today, Jimmy. Oh, okay. So once, once we get back to my channel, <laughs> I can click the Raid Now button. Yee. Maybe I can do it from Screen Manager? Ooh. Oh my gosh. It's okay. It's cool. It's very, very polished. Very polished stream. I'm very good at things. How many times do I have to click my channel? <laughs> hey, we did it. All right, everyone. Thank you again so much. I super appreciate it. I'll be back streaming video games either later today or tomorrow. Definitely tomorrow. Um, and thanks for hanging out. Cheers. Let's go see what B Sweezy is up to.